You know, again, let me say what an honor this is to be here. I just uh, am excited about this. I have to tell people when I'm excited because I'm always like this. <laughs> we went to Disney World and you know, when you, when you take the roller coaster and you crest the first hill, they take a picture and then they want to sell it to you. And you could take a picture of me right now and that's the way I look. I just... <laughs> I never fluctuate. I don't know if that's good or bad. I'm just saying that this is the way it is. So I'm telling you, I am really excited <laughs> to be here. And uh, it's a blessing. You know, I just want to share with you about the love of God, which I know that, you know, when you say that, people say, well, I know that God loves me. It's easy when you're here in church and man, the Spirit of God is here and we're singing about the goodness of God. But uh, honestly, I believe that most of our problems just come from the fact that we let Satan make us feel unworthy, condemned somehow or another. We aren't pleasing to God. And I just want to share some simple things with you. First of all, I want to share just a little tiny brief portion of my testimony to tell you why this uh, impacted me so much. But I was raised over here in Arlington, Texas. Man, this is one of the few places that you all understand the difference between come here and sick them. <laughs> I say that all around the world. People don't know what the difference is. But anyway, I was raised over here. I was raised in a Baptist church. I was born again when I was eight years old. And I mean, I was genuinely saved the next day in school. My friends could tell a difference. And when I told them I'd gotten born again, they, they made fun of me in the third grade for being born again. And I mean, I loved God and I have been seeking God my entire life, but I became religious. I didn't mean to, but I went to church and I was basically taught that you had to perform and be worthy for God to love you. So man, I performed as well as anybody I knew. I just turned 69 and... Uh, <laughs> And I have never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never said a word of profanity. I've never tasted coffee. <laughs> it's true. I've never tasted coffee. I'm not saying that coffee and booze are the same thing. You got a scripture to stand on for drinking coffee. It says you can drink any deadly thing and it shall not harm you. Man. I'm just saying that I lived a really holy life. And, but I thought that God was going to love me based on my goodness, based on my holiness. And it wasn't working. My dad died when I was 12 years old. I spent six weeks praying and I even fasted when I was 11 years old for my dad to be healed and yet he wasn't. And I saw uh, three people that I was really close to die by the time I was 18 and I prayed for all of them and I wasn't having victory and nothing was working. But man, I was doing everything I knew and every time something wouldn't work, I'd just work harder and think if I'd just do more, maybe God would answer my prayers. And then I wish I had time to go into this. I'm just going to say it quickly. But on March the 23rd, 1968, I was in a prayer meeting at 10 o'clock on a Saturday night, this is what I and all of my friends did. We'd get together and pray for two hours on Saturday night. That shows you how religious I was for an 18 year old to be praying every Saturday night. And anyway, God showed up. And uh, I don't have the words to describe this, but I mean the glory of God showed up in this Baptist pastor's study at 10 o'clock at night. And I mean, we were all plastered to the floor and uh, God showed me I was a modern day Pharisee. God showed me I was trusting in my own goodness. And, and uh, you know, I know that there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And I believe that. But at the same time, if you are trusting in yourself and thinking that you're better than somebody else, you need to have your bubble popped. You need to recognize that the only good thing in us is, is Christ. And anyway, I was trusting in myself and God showed up and for about an hour and a half, I just confessed everything I had ever done or ever would do. And remember, I hadn't done a lot of the things outwardly. And so, you know, if you've lusted in your heart, you're guilty of adultery. If you are mad without a cause, then you're guilty of murder. So I was confessing the things I had been thinking 
to the leaders of the church and all of my friends. Any reputation I ever had was just totally blown. <laughs> and I turned myself inside out. And I mean, I, I saw the glory of God, the holiness of God. And when I did, I, I had never seen myself relative to God like that. I'd always compared myself to people and compared to people, I was better than anybody I knew. And I don't mean that in a smug way. I mean, it's the truth. When I was 13, 14 years old, I was leading two and three people a week to the Lord, quote unquote. I'd just have them repeat a prayer after me and bring their scalp to church so that I could get <laughs> credit for leading them to the Lord. And um, so I, I was doing all of these things, but I thought I was somehow or another better than people. And man, when God showed up and I saw His glory, I recognized that I was nothing and I expected God to kill me. Some of you will think I'm exaggerating, but I mean, the honest truth is, I thought that when I, when I saw from God's perspective how ungodly it was for me to trust in myself, I thought God was gonna kill me. So I just turned myself inside out and confessed everything I could ever do so that if I died, that I wouldn't go to hell, I'd go to heaven. And after an hour and a half of that, I had nothing left to say. I had uh, exhausted everything I could say. And I was just laying there waiting on God's response. And to my surprise, God just poured out his love on me in a tangible way. And for four and a half months, I was gone someplace. I don't know where I was. I never slept more than an hour at a time. I never sat down and ate a meal. Now, I mean, I would sleep like an hour at a time, but I was so excited about the Lord, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sit down and eat. I'd just grab something on the go and, and eat. For four and a half months, I was just caught up in the presence of God. And it was wonderful, but I couldn't figure it out because everything I'd been taught was God loved me when I did things right. And for the first time in my life, I realized I hadn't done anything right. And it wasn't when I was at my best, it was when I was at my worst that I experienced this love of God. And I don't have time to go into this, but after four and a half months, I lost the feeling, the emotion of it left. And as good as it was to be caught up in the presence of God, it was terrible to have that emotion and feeling leave. And I didn't know what I did to make it leave. I didn't know what I did to make it come. I didn't know how to get it back. Panic set in. And one of the best things that ever happened was I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And for 13 months in Vietnam, uh, I just sat there studying the word. You know, I just found this out. We just had my 50th anniversary and my television staff went and found my chaplain from Vietnam and interviewed him. And I didn't know this, but he told on that interview that um, the uh, brigade chaplain called him up while he was out in the field and said, we've got a boy here that's too religious for us and we want to send him out to this fire support base and you keep him out there and keep him away from us. But. They had lost seven chaplain's assistant right before I got there. And the last one had died shielding this chaplain with his body and the shrapnel killed him. And anyway, this guy gave my chaplain the order, you do not let this one get killed. And I didn't know any of this. And so the, he had a special uh, instruction to keep me alive. And he just put me in a place and all I did was sit there and study the word 15 hours a day. It was awesome. I built my own bunker and then I just sat in it and studied the word all day long. And I didn't know any of these things until just recently. But anyway, my point is I was desperate because I didn't know what I did to lose this joy and this presence of the Lord. And once you had tasted what it was like to literally be caught up into the presence of the Lord. I didn't know how to go back to being normal. I didn't want to go back to being normal and I didn't know what to do and panic set in. And I actually spent 13 months in Vietnam asking God to kill me because I figured that's the only way I could ever get back into that place with the Lord. 
And it wasn't because Vietnam was bad or anything like that. It was just I was so excited about the Lord. I loved the Lord so much. I didn't know how to get back what I had lost. And um, until I got this bunker built, I actually stayed in a bunker that was wallpapered, ceiling and walls with nude pictures of women. That was where the other guys were. And so the only way I could keep my mind on the Lord was just like this. <laughs> couldn't even, you know, put my Bible down and meditate on it. I was just like this. And out of desperation, I didn't know what else to do. So I just started reading the Word and man, it transformed my life. I didn't mean to. I was a Baptist when I went to Vietnam. And when I came out, I wasn't a Baptist anymore. They kicked me out of the church. But anyway, what I want to share with you is you know, it says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, the parable of the sower sowing the seed. And the very first type of uh, person that received the seed was a person who didn't understand. And it says Satan came immediately and stole away the word from him. The only people that Satan can steal the word from is people that don't understand. Now, there's other things. You can have the word choked and things like that. But the only one that he had access to without restriction was people that didn't understand. And if I hadn't have come to understand some truths, I would have lost the benefit of that experience. As a matter of fact, I've shared this all around the world and I've had many people come up and say that God touched them in a really special way at one time and yet they lost it. And this is probably more typical than not is that people have God do things in their life, but if you don't have understanding, Satan comes and steals it from you. And what I want to share with you is some really simple stuff that may sound so simple, I hope you don't reject it. But this is profound, and this is what allowed me to start understanding God's love for me, apart from a feeling. You know, if you have some supernatural encounter and you just feel the presence of God, that's not real hard to handle. But you aren't going to live that way. God doesn't want you to live on that plane. It says in Hebrews 11:6, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And God will sometimes grace you with these things where you just experience God in a tangible way. But that is not going to be the norm. And if you don't understand and learn how to walk by faith, if you're just living from, you know, experience to experience, you're going to be basically a defeated Christian. You've got to learn what the Word says and begin to walk by faith. And so here are some of the things that God taught me. Let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And this is so simple, you're going to have to have somebody to help you to misunderstand this. It is not complicated, but it, it, it takes a revelation from God. This is not the normal way of thinking. So I pray that God opens up your heart to receive these truths. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And there's so much good stuff here. I wish I could read all of it, but I've got a lot of ground I want to cover. So let's start with verse 16. He, he was talking about how Jesus died for all because all were dead. And since he did that for us, we ought to live for him. In verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. You know, that's a verse that's probably not really underlined and stuff in your Bible, but that is profound. This is profound. We don't know any man after the flesh. You know, all of our problems in society are because people do not live this way. They only know people after the flesh. They know them based on their skin color. They know them based on their education, on their prosperity level, and all of these different kind of things, the way they talk. All of that stuff is flesh. We aren't supposed to know any man after the flesh. He says we knew Christ after the flesh, you know, this is the Apostle Paul talking. And the Apostle Paul was in Jerusalem. He was raised at the feet of Gamaliel, the uh, leading rabbi in the city. And I guarantee you, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, it says the whole city was on an uproar. I can guarantee you that, that Paul saw Jesus sometime or another. 
If you would have asked him, you know, what did Jesus look like? He could have told you how tall he was, could have told you different things about him. He knew him after the flesh, but he didn't know him after the spirit. Matter of fact, Jesus' own disciples didn't know Jesus after the spirit. Right as he was getting ready to leave this earth, he says, where I'm going, you know, and the way you know. And they said, we don't know where you're going. Boy, he was just hours away from being crucified. And the guys that he had spent three and a half years investing himself into their life, they said, we don't know. And then he says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And they said, show us the Father and we'll be satisfied. <laughs> like, there's a reason they were called disciples. <laughs> These were not the sharpest knives in the drawer. And so his own disciples didn't really know him. Did you know that John, on, in the Last Supper, he laid on Jesus' bosom, on his chest? And there's nothing wrong with that. It was, he, they, they felt the love and they were connected with him, and that's fine. But did you know that Jesus, that was the exact same person that John saw in Revelation chapter 1, but this time his eyes were like fire and his feet were as polished brass. And when he spoke, it was like thunder and John fell at his feet as if he was dead. Did you know that was the same Jesus? But Jesus was wrapped in this physical body and people couldn't really perceive who he was because they only knew him after the flesh. They only knew him naturally. And of course, none of us have seen Jesus with our physical eyes, but you know what? Sad to say, there are a lot of Christians that only know Jesus after the flesh. They only know him if they get caught up in the presence of God and feel his love and have a goose bump go up and down their spine. And if there is something tangible going on, they only know God after the flesh. And I'm telling you, that's, a, that's not good. Again, because he loves us so much, God will manifest himself to us. God will do things, but the end goal is never to know God after the flesh, never to just get to a place, oh, I know that God's here because I feel him. Man, if you feel him, wonderful. But you ought to know that he's with you whether you feel him or not. <laughs> you know, one of the things that happened to me in Vietnam was I'd had this experience and I was just in Vietnam praying, oh God, I want to have this experience. I want to get back to this feeling. I, I was begging God. I was fasting and uh, doing all kinds of things. And I just couldn't get back this emotion. And then one day I woke up and I mean, not only did I not have a special anointing or a special feeling of God's presence, it was if God had died. There was nothing. I don't have the words to describe to you, but I really believe that one of the worst things of hell is going to be that there is no presence of God, no awareness of God. You can talk about the fire and other things, but man, I was without the feeling or the awareness of God's presence. I know according to the word, he never leaves us nor forsakes us, but here's the way I look at it is, I was begging, oh God, give me a feeling, give me emotion again. And God just said, you know what? You need to get out of the flesh and looking for me in the flesh. And he just took away from me all knowledge of his presence. Nothing special, but just being normal. And for three days, it was like God had died. I was besides myself. I was a chaplain's assistant. And when people would come to the chaplain's a bunker, I was supposed to make appointments and do things. And I literally got in a corner of my bunker and put clothes over me and hid under the clothes. I was afraid to look at a person in the face. I was petrified. You can, you can rationalize that any way you want to and say I was immature and all. I don't know what it was, but I guarantee you it was like God was gone. And for three days, it was terrible. And I panicked, man, I was praying. I was doing everything I knew to do. And on the third day, I woke up beside my cot. I slept on an army cot and I woke up and I was kneeling, praying, and there was nothing special. There was no bells and whistles. There was no great awareness of God. I was just back to normal. And you know, from that moment on, I said, God, I'll never beg you for another special thing. Amen. I'm glad to be just normal. Amen. <laughs> I don't need something special. And I began to start learning to walk by faith instead of by feelings. 
And this is what it's talking about. We don't know Christ after the flesh. At one time they knew him after the flesh, but they didn't even know him. Actually, did you know that when Jesus was in his physical body, it was a hindrance. And I know some of you think, oh, I'd have loved it. It's actually easier for you to relate to the Lord than it was his physical disciples. Because those disciples, they saw Jesus hungry. They saw him tired. They smelt him. Did you know you, he didn't carry a whole bunch of clothes with him and they didn't stay in a holiday inn every night. They walked 20 miles a day in the heat and I guarantee you he got sweaty, he got smelly. They saw Jesus go to the bathroom. How do you reconcile this is God <laughs> with that? You know what, your physical body his physical body was like a curtain or a veil that really concealed who he was. When he appeared in Romans chapter one with his eyes of fire and all of this, that is who he really was. But he was in this physical body. When he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he just pulled back that veil for a little bit and light just flooded out of him and they saw the glory of God. He was like that all of the time, but he kept the curtain closed. He kept it encased in his physical body. Their body... His body was actually a, something that hindered them from seeing who he really was. Today, we don't have to deal with that. We can go to the Word of God and we can picture him sitting at the Father's right hand. We can see him today walking in this place and touching people and you can envision him in his glory and in his power. You don't have the limitation of his physical body. So we shouldn't know people after the flesh. We shouldn't know Christ after the flesh. And then in verse 17, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You know what? You shouldn't know yourself after the flesh. It's not enough just not to know other people after the flesh and know Jesus after the flesh. You need to know who you really are. And we have an identity crisis in the body of Christ. You know, if somehow or another we've been in contact and if I said, I'm going to be at Eagle Mountain International Church this morning and uh, I want to meet you, who are you? You could, you could describe yourself, whether you're male or female, tall, short, fat, skinny, whatever. You could describe your physical body. And if I was to ask you about your soulish person, did you know you could describe, oh, I'm a real extrovert, I'm an outgoing person, I'm a real happy person, or you'll know me, I'm depressed, man. <laughs> and you can describe yourself like that. But did you know most of us can't describe who we are in Christ? We, we use these terminologies, but we really don't see ourselves that way. This says that if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. One translation says you're a new species of being that never existed before. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It didn't say old things are passing away. It didn't say that this is a process. It describes it as it's a done deal. And I was in Vietnam reading this and I was just trying to be honest with the Lord and saying, God, it says that old things have passed away, all things have become new. And I said, I want that to be so. But I said, man, there's still so many things in my life that aren't right. And I was saying, I know I'm in you. I know I'm born again. I knew that if I died, I'd go to be with the Lord. And yet there were lots of things in my life that weren't the way they were supposed to be. And I said, I don't doubt your word. How do I understand this? And um, keep your finger there. I might be back if I can talk quickly enough. But look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He led me to this verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, not H-O-L-Y, but W-H-O-L-L-Y. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord. And this is what just revolutionized my life because I had experienced this love of God. I knew that God was more real than I could ever describe him. I knew he was awesome. I had felt his love and... I didn't know how to get back to where I was, but I was thinking, God, how could you love me? Because I'm not that lovely. 
And I know that this is offensive to some people who you think you're awesome. And you say, but oh, I'm really awesome. That's one of the reasons you haven't experienced the love of God because you're so full of yourself. <laughs> if you're all wrapped up in yourself, you make a very small package. And I'm telling you, this is where most of us live. There's, there's either extremes to this. Some people think that they're just awesome and they don't need God because you can handle it. Or there's other people that are just so condemned that you wonder, how could God love me? Either one of those, you aren't going to experience the true nature and character of God working in your life. I tell you, one, the, the biggest obstacle to God using you and you having a great relationship with God is not your sin, it's your self-righteousness. Self-righteous people are the only people Jesus ever rebuked. He went into the prostitute, to the adulteress, to the scribes and Pharisees are the ones that he rebuked and stuff. He can tolerate any sin better than self-righteousness. Thank you for that one truth. <laughs> Church has made the whole, the whole problem sin, which again, please don't misunderstand. I hadn't got time to explain this. This is what pastors are for. George will straighten this all out after I leave. <laughs> Praise God. I am not saying we should sin. No, you should not sin. If you sin, you're stupid. <laughs> it's just stupid to live in sin because Satan will take advantage of you. He will eat your lunch and pop the bag if you go live in sin. So don't live in sin. If you live in sin, you're stupid. But what I'm saying is God loves you, stupid, even when you live in sin. God's not mad at you, but... The one thing that God cannot flow through is a person who says, God, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. Now I know you're going to use me because I am worthy. That is the greatest offense of all. You may not look at it this way, but what you're saying is, Jesus, I don't need you or I don't need everything you've done. I just need a little bit of help from you to make up for my difference. Paul said, I have no confidence in the flesh. No confidence not a little bit of confidence, no confidence. He's, he says, all of the things that were gained to me, I counted but loss and count them but dung that I may know Christ. We take our dung and frame it and put it on the wall. <laughs> I'm not, but I'm just saying that, man, you can't trust in yourself. And see, this was the problem with me. I knew God existed. I knew he had all of this power, but I was looking at myself and I was aware of all of my inadequacies and how much I failed God. And I thought, God, how can a holy God love me? I don't even love me. There's things about myself that I don't like. How can you love me? And this may sound really simple to you, but this just transformed my life when I realized it says, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things have passed away. Everything has become new. And it just dawned on me. That's not talking about my body. My body's not new. I've got a promise that I'm going to get a new body. This mortal will put on immortality. But this body isn't saved. And my soul isn't saved. If I had more time, I could teach on this and explain it in more detail. But your soul is real simply, it's not all, everything, but it's your mind, your will, your emotions. Your emotions are in this soulish realm. And did you know in that realm, you aren't saved. You don't, when you get born again, you don't all of a sudden have my memories or somebody else's memories, you still have all of your memories. You have all of your past experiences. Your mind is still your mind. You know what? If you were fat before you got saved, you're going to be fat after you get saved. Your body did not get changed. If you were dumb before you got saved, you're going to be dumb after you get saved unless you renew your mind. Your body and your soul are not changed. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. But... It says over in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body. For the first time in my life, I realized there was a difference between your spirit and soul. I was using them interchangeably. 
Basically, functionally, I was only seeing myself as a two-part being. My body, which is obvious, and then there's an inner person. You know, all of us are aware of your body. If I wanted to say, are you hot or cold right now? You don't have to say, well, let me pray about it and I'll come back and tell you tomorrow. You just, you monitor your body. You know if you're hot or cold. You know if you have pain in your body. You know all of these things. You don't have to pray about it, think about it. You just know this stuff. And if I was to ask you, are you encouraged or discouraged? Are you happy or sad? You don't have to say, well, let me pray about it and I'll come back and tell you tomorrow. You know instantly. You monitor your body and your soul constantly. But there is a third part to you that most Christians do not functionally realize. We approach God based on, oh God, I failed you. I haven't studied the word. I got mad at my wife. I did this. And we talk about what we've done in our flesh. But it says very clearly in John chapter 4, verse 24, that God is a spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When you come before God and say, oh God, I'm, I'm just, I failed you again. God, I'm not the person I'm supposed to be. You aren't approaching God in spirit. You're approaching him in flesh. You're approaching him based on your performance. And when you come before him and say, oh God, I'm just so sad. I'm so discouraged. Would you please touch me? Some of you won't understand this. Again, praise God for Pastor George and Terry. They will straighten things out when I'm gone and explain this to you. But you know what? People come up and say, would you please pray that God would just pour his love out in my life? And I say, no, I won't pray that. And people say, well, what's wrong with that? Why would you not pray that? Because the Bible says he's already commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It says that, man, he looked, God is love. But I don't feel the love of God. The problem is you're in the flesh. You're approaching him based in your emotions and in your body and in your feelings. And I'm telling you, God is a spirit. And if you're going to connect with God, you've got to worship him in spirit and in truth. Well, what's my spirit like? It's brand new. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. In your spirit, you are as pure and holy right this instant as Jesus is seated at the right hand of God the Father. Now, you know, sometimes we'll talk about this and people say, oh yeah, I believe I'm clean in Jesus. But then on a functional basis, the next time you mess up, you, oh God, I'm so unworthy. How could you love me? Because God's not flesh and blood. He doesn't know you after the flesh. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God knows about your flesh. He knows what you're doing, but he doesn't relate to you based on your actions and your emotions. He relates to you based on your born again self. And it says in Ephesians chapter 4, you know, I'm talking as fast as I can talk. And so rather than turn over and look up every one of these verses, hopefully you'll write it down or get a CD or something and you can go study it out. But Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24 says, put on the new man. That's talking about this part of you. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. You were created righteous. You aren't becoming righteous. I go to churches all the time and I hear people praying, oh God, just make me righteous. And I say, get born again. The moment you get born again, you are righteous. You are completely righteous. Oh, but this person is still living in sin. Well, that is going to open up a door to the devil and it's going to cause you problems. There are consequences to sin. I am not saying that we should live in sin. But I'm saying God is a spirit and God looks at you in the spirit. And once you get born again, you were created righteous and truly holy, implying that there's false holy. If there's a truly holy, then there's a false holy. You know what false holiness is? is when you have your hair piled up on your head a certain length and your dress is all the way down to the floor and you're, you don't show any of your wrist. And uh, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but if you do that to be accepted by God and you can't wear makeup and stuff like this, and if that's what makes you holy, then you're unholy. That's false holiness. God's looking at your spirit. Man, if your barn needs painting, paint it. 
And if it needs two coats, give it two coats, amen. <laughs> you know, Jamie and I were over here this morning looking and, and Jamie commented on how nice everybody up here looked. The guys wearing suits, the ladies dressed nice. And you know what? God loves us. I just came from a place where everybody there had holes in their jeans, which I'm not against that. I know I'm an old man. And I know that I'm another generation. God loves you if you got holes in your jeans and stuff, but I thought it looked nice. <laughs> I thought it looked nice to see everybody dressed up up here. So I personally don't dress that way. But you know what? God's not looking on your outward appearance. It doesn't matter to God. You can do all kinds of stuff. But if you are approaching God based on how you dress and how you've acted and, oh God, I haven't been kind the way I should, I hadn't studied the Word the way I should and stuff like that, you're approaching God in the flesh. And you know what? Even though you can improve your flesh, the more you seek God, it's still going to be flesh. It doesn't matter if you've got 100% USDA choice flesh, it's still <laughs> flesh. And if you are in the flesh, you cannot please God. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. And this, this is the very reason that most people aren't connecting with God is because they are trapped. They functionally only believe about the body, the physical realm, and then the mental, emotional realm. And if you don't feel the love of God, oh God, would you pour your love out in my life? No, I won't pray that. That's a slap in the face of God when he says, I've already committed my love towards you. Now I will pray this, God straighten this person out. <laughs> They're in the flesh. They don't believe that you love them because they don't feel it, because they don't have a goosebump running up and down their spine. Father, they're carnal. Father, help them to get into the Spirit. I'll pray with you about that. But to pray and say, oh God, would you pour out your Spirit when the Bible says He's already poured out His Spirit, that He loves you and there's nothing you can do about it. You can't make Him love you more. You can't make Him love you less. God loves you, period. And if you said, but I don't feel it, just pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up, amen, and begin to start operating in what the Word of God has to say. <laughs> I know some of you aren't enjoying this. <laughs> but it set me free to find out that, oh God, you mean the whole time I was sitting here saying, oh God, where are you? Would you please just let me feel your presence? Would you love me? You know, when I was in Vietnam, the, the song came out about, I've got joy like a fountain, peace like a river, love like the ocean in my soul. I wouldn't sing it. Because I said, I may be a lot of things, but I'm not going to be a hypocrite. <laughs> I don't have love, joy, and peace. And I said, I'm not singing that until I have it. And then when the Lord showed me this, I found out that the whole time the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. <laughs> I had love, joy, and peace in me the entire time. I was just going by what I felt instead of what the Word of God says about me. And the whole time that I was thinking I was being honest, what I was being was carnal. Yeah. Oh God, I don't feel your love, so do you still love me? Yes. Amen. And if you don't feel it, you're wrong. But I want to feel it. You know what? When you get to a place to where God, I don't have to feel something. I don't have to have something physical. I'm going to take the Word of God and honor the Word of God. And when you get to where you start operating in that, you'll actually have more feelings than you did when you were seeking feelings. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, most of us are carnal. And the word carnal is like a dirty word to most people. It's like, oh, I don't want to be carnal. Those are people that are God haters. No, the word carnal, you know, I learned this from Kenneth back many, many years ago. The word carnal just means flesh, as stripped of skin, and we use the word carnal to refer, you know, it's the same root word as chili con carne. <laughs> At chili with meat, the word carnal means meat. So when you're saying you're carnally minded, you're calling yourself a meathead. <laughs> you're just operating in the natural realm. You're just going by what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. You're carnal. 
It, you, you don't have to be terribly sinful. You can be straight as a gun barrel and twice as empty and be carnal. <laughs> you could be doing everything right and going to church and saying your confessions and do everything and be totally in the flesh thinking that God, now you've got to move because I've done this. That's carnal. God doesn't have to do anything. Man, I got a great teaching, but I hadn't got time to give it to you on the difference between uh, living in the balance of grace and faith. God by grace has already done everything. You don't, God's not going to do anything for you. It's already done. You don't get God to move by faith. Faith doesn't move God. Faith moves you over to where God's already done these things. And it just allows you to appropriate what God has already done. I've got that out there someplace. Living in the balance of grace and faith. So old things are passed away, all things have become new. Well, how do you know what's happened in your spirit? Again, if you want to know what's happened in your body, it's easy. You constantly feel what's going on in your body. You constantly know what's going on in your emotions. But the Bible says in John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus was the one speaking and he says, it's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. He didn't say a little bit. He said it profits nothing. And then he went on to say, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. God's word is a perfect representation of the spirit. You, it, you know, if you want to see if your hair's combed, you have to go look in a mirror. Right now, I hope my hair's combed, but I can't tell if my hair's combed by just feeling you know what? I have to go look in a mirror and I have to trust what I see and just take action based on what I see. But where, how do you see what your spirit is like? You don't, the word, it's a spiritual mirror. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. John chap, James chapter one says, whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty is a man, like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. You behold your face in a mirror and you see what it's like. You know, here's a radical thought for you. Did you know that you have never seen your face? Some of you think, oh, I have too. You have not. You've seen a picture of your face. You've seen a reflection of your face. You've seen a drawing of your face. But with your eyes, you have never looked at your faith, face. How do you know that the image in the mirror is correct? You know, I was in Uganda and the elevator had a mirror right beside it and it made you look tall and skinny. It was, a, it was an image, but it was a wrong image. How do you know that the image you're seeing is correct? I'm not trying to get you to doubt the image. I'm just saying that, you know what? You take by faith what you see. You have never physically with your eyes looked yourself eyeball to eyeball. You look at a reflection and you trust it. We need to get to where we look into this perfect law of liberty, this spiritual mirror, and this is who I am. Somebody walks up and says, how are you? Oh man, I'm hurting all over. You're talking about the flesh. Oh, I've been discouraged. Nobody knows the trouble I feel. You're talking about the flesh. If you were to know each other only after the spirit and not after the flesh, somebody says, how are you? You ought to say, well, let me see right here. Ephesians 1, 3, I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'm healed, I'm delivered, I'm set free. On and on it goes. But see, most of us, honestly, we identify with the physical, natural part of us instead of who we are in Christ. It's who you are in Christ that got changed. It's, that's the real you. You are a spirit. You have a soul. You live in a body, but the real you is this spirit being. And the key to the Christian life is learning how to live from your spirit, who you are in Christ, and not go by how you feel and not based on your performance. But you find out who you are in Christ, and that's how you start living. You know, when I saw this, like I said, I started saying, man, I had love, joy, and peace the whole time I was sitting there refusing to sing that song. And now I don't care whether I'm feeling love, joy, and peace or not. I've got it and I'll talk it and I'll act it regardless of what I feel like. And somebody says, well, you're just being hypocritical. 
Well, it just depends who you think is the real you. If you think the real you is the born again part that is exactly like Jesus, then you're a hypocrite to say, I hurt and I'm discouraged and I'm depressed because that's not the real you. And if you say, well, I'm not going to sit here and say I'm healed and I've got victory when I don't feel it. Well, that's because you believe that the flesh is the real you. It just depends on who you consider to be the real you. So Ephesians 4.24 says you were created in righteousness and true holiness. 1 John chapter 4 verse 17 says herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world. And some people will say, well, man, that's me. I'm living just like Jesus. I'm talking like Jesus. I'm walking like Jesus. I'm laying hands on the side. I'm doing all of these things. You missed it. You missed it. You might be living holier than I am. You may be manifesting more power than I am, but I can guarantee you in your flesh is not what it's talking about. You are not like Jesus in your flesh. I don't care if you fast five days out of the week. I don't care if you read the Bible from cover to cover every month. I don't care how holy you're living. Your body, your actions, and your soul are never going to be identical to Jesus in this life. They will reflect Jesus to a degree. And to the degree that we do that, it's to our advantage. It cuts down Satan's inroad into our life and it glorifies God. So I'm telling you, yes, you should be living holy, but you are deceived if you think that your body and your soul are identical to Jesus. As Jesus is, so are we. And so people say, well, it's talking about when we get to heaven, we're going to be like him. It says, so are we in this world, in this world. The only part of you that is identical to Jesus right now is your spirit. Your spirit was created righteous and truly holy. And as Jesus is, so are you in this world. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And the Greek word one there is hes, H-E-I-S. And it means a singular one to the exclusion of another. You don't have Jesus spirit in you and then your little baby born again spirit. It says in Ephesians chapter, or excuse me, Galatians chapter four, I believe it's around verse six. It says, he sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. When you got born again, God's spirit, the spirit of Jesus entered into you. Your born again spirit is the spirit of Christ. And it is as holy and pure as Jesus is. It's got all of his power, all of his anointing. Man, if I had time, I could tell you so many scriptures. I've got everything that the Lord has taught me is based on this principle right here. But it says that you have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. That's not talking about your little peanut-sized brain up here. That's talking about in your spirit. You know all things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. All things. Not some things, not more than somebody else. You know all things. That's not talking about your brain. That's talking about in your spirit. You got supernatural knowledge. Supernatural knowledge. Somebody's thinking, what good does all this do me if it's in my spirit? The biggest part of the battle is just knowing what you've got. Philemon chapter one, verse six, Paul prayed a prayer for Philemon and he says, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The first step in seeing God's power manifest in you is to recognize it's in you. It's not out there. You don't have to pray the power down. People will say, well, man, that prayer didn't get above the ceiling. You don't need your prayer to get above your nose. God's right here. That's the reason you bow your head when you pray. Say, Father. <laughs> But see this concept that all oh, that prayer didn't get past the demons and it didn't get above the ceiling and stuff. It's just wrong. Man, you've already in the spirit, you've got the mind of Christ. This is the reason that speaking in tongues is so important. 
Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 14, 14, when you pray in an unknown tongue, you, your spirit pray. That's verse 13. Or I'm not sure what that is. Let me look this up. It's either 13 or 14 here. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 says, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. And then the verse right in front of that, verse 13, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue pray that he may interpret. So when you come into a crisis situation, you say, Father, with my brain, I don't know what to do. You know, 1 Corinthians 13 says, now we prophesy in part. We know in part. We prophesy in part. But then there's coming a day then we'll know all things, even as also we are known. With my little peanut-sized brain, I don't know everything. But I have a spirit that has an unction from the Holy One, and I know all things. I've got the mind of Christ. So how do I get it out? When I pray in tongues, my spirit, the part of me that has the mind of Christ, is praying, and all I've got to do is say, Father, what was that I said? What's the answer to this? This needs more explanation than what I have time to give it. Praise God for Pastor George and Terry. They'll straighten us out. Let me give you an example that the Lord told me to finish out this building in Colorado Springs. And this is, this is back in 2002. I had a really the second most important encounter I ever had with the Lord. He told me some things. And anyway, we started... A process. We, we bought a building for $3.2 million. I took out a loan on that. And then I was going to um, take out a construction loan for $3.2 million to refurbish this building. And for nine months, I tried to get this construction loan. The bank kept telling me, says, uh, you know, you're approved. It's okay. We wouldn't have given you the loan to buy the building if you couldn't have finished it out. And so... Um, Anyway, they told me, it's okay, you'll get it next week, next week for nine months. And after nine months, they finally came and said, you know, it's been so long, let's just start the whole process over. Let's go back through another appraisal and all I could see was nine more months. And so I said, no, let me pray about it. You know, it'd be so much better if you prayed about things before you got in trouble instead of waiting until you're in trouble. But anyway... I, I went home and I, I said, Father, I know that my spirit has an answer for this. That I know what to do. That I have the mind of Christ. And I said, I'm going to pray in tongues and I believe for an interpretation. And I've got this trail on my property that I've built. And before I got from, like, from that wall over to that wall, before I got that far praying in tongues, I had God bring a prophecy back to me that had been given to me two years before. And they said, you will not need to take out a loan to build this because you have a bank. And I said, what bank do I have? <laughs> and he went on to say, your partners are your bank. You won't go in debt. You can do this debt free. And I, I said, God, is that the answer that I'm not supposed to be in debt on this? And this was a big step because $3.2 million back at that time in our ministry, Jamie had saved, I think it was $30,000 over two or three years or something. And that's all we had. And to come up with $3.2 million, I figured it out. I'd have been in my 150s by the time we got this thing built. And yet the Bible says that if you, you know, a godly man will swear to his own hurt and change not. If I said I was going to do it this way, then I was going to have to stick to it. And it would either be the best thing that ever happened or the worst thing that ever happened. But so I spent about a week or so praying about it to make sure that that was God. But I, I eventually felt like this was Lord. And I went in and told my manager, I said, we aren't going in debt. I said, if they come to me tomorrow and offer me the $3.2 million, I'm going to turn it down. I said, we're going to do this debt free. And guess what? The next day, they offered me $4 million. They said, you need $4 million. We've approved you. Here's the check. And I said, you're a day late. <laughs> and I turned it down. And praise God, we moved into that building completed in 14 months and got it done. And <laughs> And in just the last six years, we've spent over $70 million debt-free on buildings, building a Bible college campus. And it's working. Amen. And you know where that came from? In my spirit. 
I had the mind of Christ. I knew all things, but I didn't have it up here. So I had to pray and ask God for an interpretation. And I have done this hundreds, thousands of times. Every one of you has the mind of Christ. But if you search your brain up here, where, do I have the mind of Christ? God, I, you're needing wisdom and you, you, you're asking for direction and you can't even find your glasses. And they're on top of your head. And you're thinking, I just don't know this. Well, it, with your brain you don't, but your spirit man knows it. See, the victory in the Christian life is learning how to walk from your spirit. You're saying, well, God, this person wants prayer. They're in a wheelchair, but God, I don't feel anything. That's flesh. And if you were in the flesh, you can't please God. What does the Word say? The Word says that you have the same spirit living on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 18 through 20 talks about that you would open up the eyes of their understanding and show them the exceeding greatness of your power towards them. The same power that he used when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. You've got the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus from the dead. It's not out there that you have to pray it down. It's in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You've already got it. Everything you're asking God for, you've already got. I've got a teaching out there entitled, You've Already Got It. It's got a picture of a dog chasing his tail. And then he catches it and finds out he already had it. You know what? Everything you're asking, oh God, heal me. He says, by his stripes, you were healed. Oh God, I'm asking you to bless me. You are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly. Oh God, I just need wisdom. He's abounded towards you with all wisdom and prudence. You have the mind of Christ. Everything that you're wanting, it's already in there. It's like Prego spaghetti sauce. Whatever it is that you want, it's in there. Amen. <laughs> you remember that commercial? Anything you want, it's in there. I keep pointing to my belly because John chapter 7, Jesus said, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the spirit. So the belly is somewhere in here is where your spirit is. Some of you look like you got more of the spirit than others, but it's not true. <laughs> Amen. I tell you, brothers and sisters, you're loaded. You're loaded. Everything you're asking God for, you've already got it. I could just imagine Jesus sitting at the right hand of God the Father and people right here in this room, oh God, heal me. Oh God, I'm fasting, I'm praying, I'm believing that you're going to heal me. Heal me, Jesus. I could just imagine the Father saying, didn't you tell them that by your stripes they were healed? Why would they ask for something that they've already got? You know why we ask for things we've already got? Because we don't believe we have it. Because we can't feel it, we can't see it, and we are ignorant of the spirit realm. The spirit realm created the physical realm. The spirit realm is more real than the physical realm. The spirit realm will exist long after this physical realm is gone. The real you is the spirit being, and I'm telling you, you are identical to Jesus. As Jesus is, so are you. He that's joined unto the Lord is one Spirit. You're identical to Jesus in the spirit realm. If there are such things as atoms and molecules in the spirit realm, you are atom for atom, molecule for molecule, identical to Jesus. You got his mind. You have his ability. You got his anointing. Now, it's not enough to just keep it in the spirit. You need to get it out. And you do that through the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. The way you get transformed, that Greek word is metamorpho. It's a word we get metamorphosis from where a caterpillar spins a cocoon and comes out a butterfly. If you want to change from a caterpillar to a butterfly, you do it by the renewing of your mind. 
You've already got everything right here. But it's got to get through your brain before it can go to your body. You know, just imagine this. Imagine that up over my head here, you got a, like a big old pipe or something. And over on one side is the spirit. Over here is like a faucet. You know, where, uh, like a water pipe where the water flows through. And in the middle, your soul is like a valve. And your mind, if you are crossways, you can stop the flow of the spirit from ever getting out through your body by the way you think. If you're sitting there and the doctor says you're going to die, God's word says by his stripes you're already healed. You got the same power living on the inside of you that raised Christ from the dead, etc. All of these things. But your mind, you are more moved by what the doctor had to say than you are by what God has to say. You can shut that valve so that not one drop of this anointing that's on the inside of you ever gets out here to your physical body. And sad to say, brothers and sisters, that's where most of us are living. And especially if you go to this church, I know you know a lot of the Word. You know what the Word says. But how many of us are going by what the Spirit says versus by what you feel in your body? And I don't know about you, but this changed my life when I just realized I had an option. That there was a third part of me that I hadn't even been aware of. Now when I have discouragement come, and I have a lot of discouraging things come at me. But I can truthfully say that for the last 48 or 49 years, I have not been depressed. I have not been discouraged. I will never be depressed because I found out what I had in the spirit. Now I have depressing things come. I've had people kidnap me. I've been threatened to be killed. I've been spit upon. I've been lied about just like, you know, a lot of other people. And I've had discouraging things happen, but now I know that I have a choice. Am I going to let these things bother me? Or am I going to operate in the Spirit? You know, I went to Pritchett, Colorado. Jamie and I moved there. We saw a man raised from the dead. And because of that, we went to this little church with 10 people in a town of 144 people. And because this guy was raised from the dead, we started having 100 people come to church in a town of 144 people. It made a huge impact. But they hated me. And they got to calling me names. They accused me of committing adultery, stealing money from the church, getting drunk, doing dope. Uh, they accused me of all kinds of things. And anyway, I started feeling this depression and discouragement like I gave up the little bit of success I had in Childress, Texas, where we had 50 people or so coming to church. And I moved to Pritchett, Colorado with 10 people in the church. And I gave up everything I had to come there. Nobody appreciated me. And so I was just waiting on Jamie and my boys to go to bed so that I could go down into the basement and just gripe and complain and throw a pity party. I'd already sent out all of my invitations. <laughs> all of the demons in Baca County had shown up. And I was just waiting on them to go to sleep so I could go down into the basement and whine and cry. And uh, so I've, I've had discouragement come at me. But, you know, as I was waiting, I just was sitting at the kitchen table and I just flopped my Bible open and it just happened to flop open to Galatians 5, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering. And I knew right then, I said, God, I know that in my spirit I have these things, but I want to gripe. I want to complain. I said, I'd feel better if I just let it all out. And you know, God's not going to argue with you. He just showed me those verses and then leaves me on my own to think about it. <laughs> and I, I realized that if I did this, it could be disaster. And so I didn't feel like praising God. I felt like crying. I felt like griping. I felt like complaining. It wasn't fair the way they were treating me. But you know what? I went down into the basement and I started praising God through gritted teeth. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> blessed. I didn't feel it. I'm not even sure I believed it at the beginning. But I just started doing what the Word of God said and operating in the Spirit. And somebody, well, that's not the Spirit because you didn't feel it. You know, ultimately you aren't just a spirit. You need to get your soul and body in line. And the real sweet spot is when spirit, soul, and body are in a line. 
But if you wait until you feel it before you do it, you're going to miss God nine out of ten times. You just got to do. You got to take charge. Paul said, I mortify my flesh. I keep under my body. You do what's right regardless of what you feel like. So I just started praising God, not because I felt it, but because I believed it. And did you know within just a short period of time, I began to start really feeling the love and the joy of God. And I stayed up all night long just praising God. Had an awesome time. And I started in the flesh maybe, but I wound up in the spirit. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, it has set me free. Somebody said, well, it doesn't sound free to me. You, you have these negative feelings and you're just pushing them down. You aren't, you're, you're in denial. I am in denial. I am in denial that I'm only flesh. There is a part of me that is pure spirit that has been born again, that's righteous and holy and pure and because of that, I've got a choice whether I go by my feelings and what I feel like or whether I go by what the Word says. I am in denial that I am only human. That old song about, Lord, I'm only human. I'm just a man. One day at a time, sweet Jesus. It'll kill you. <laughs> you aren't only human. One third of you is wall to wall Holy Ghost. You have the power of God living on the inside of you. And the key is finding out who you are and saying, I, this is who I am and this is how I'm going to act. And I refuse to act contrary. But I don't feel like it. Well, then your feelings are wrong. The Bible tells you what you are, what you have, what you can do. And the victory is learning how to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit isn't going around with a sick look on your face with your hands folded like this and saying hallelujah. Walking in the Spirit is just walking. What does the Word say about you? Does the Word say you're an overcomer? Well, then I'm an overcomer. But you look like you're being overcome. Well, you just, you're just looking on the outside. On the inside, I'm an overcomer. The Word says I'm healed. Anybody can tell by looking at you, you aren't healed. But see, they're only judging things according to the flesh. They're only looking on the flesh. In the Spirit, I got the same power that raised Christ from the dead, and I'm going to walk in the Spirit and confess who I am in the Spirit. Amen. Amen. I know some of you think I'm weird, but I think you're weird. <laughs> I think you're weird to have the life of God on the inside, and then we're just sitting here talking like, oh God, I'm only human. I'm not only human. Oh God, the doctor says I'm sick. Yeah, but Dr. Jesus said you're well. Which are you going to believe? It's really this simple. It's not this easy. One of the hardest things you'll ever do in your life is renew your mind to where what you see, taste, hear, smell, and feel does not dominate you, but you're walking by faith and not by sight. I tell you, that's not easy. That takes a renewing of the mind. And you can't watch 10 hours of As the Stomach Turns on the television <laughs> and be strong in this word. You got to find out who you are. And this is, when you read it from this pers perspective, it just, the word comes alive. When the Lord showed me this, now all of a sudden all kinds of scriptures are alive to me that were closed before because it's not talking about your physical body. When it says, as he is, so are you in this world, it's not talking about your physical body. It's talking about your spirit, man. You are as Jesus is. But in order for you to see that manifest, you've got to renew your mind. You got to unclog this valve. You got to open the valve. You got to start letting this out. Your three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Spirit, soul, and body. If you get your soul in agreement with your flesh, that's two against one, and it shuts off the flow of the Spirit. But if you get your soul in agreement with the Spirit, man, that's two against one, and your physical body has to receive. It has no choice. It will work. Amen? So, Father, we just thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for these truths. Father, I thank you for what it's done in my life and I pray that the Holy Spirit enlightens people here today and that they understand this, that it becomes revelation to them. 
Father, for people who've been living in condemnation and guilt because they know that they aren't everything that they're supposed to be, Father, help them to start worshiping you in spirit and in truth, to come before you on the basis of what Jesus has done and not allow their conscience to defile them, that they would be cleansed through a pure conscience and enter into the holiest place by a new and living way. Thank you, Father. Father, we just agree and we receive this.